Um, welcome to the second of the series of uh, Artist Talks this term. Uh, James has been traveling around like a mad person for the last couple of weeks, I gather, so I hope he's got uh, enough energy for this. But if he's anything like Dorothy Cross last week, he'll race through it. So, uh, uh, yeah, I think you should start. James. Microphone on? Yes. How much time do we have now? Okay. Um, how about a remote for the slides? Yeah. <clears throat> oh, okay, so that's. Yeah. All right. So why don't we just start by dimming the lights? Uh, so I, I have uh, brought in slides of work that I've done over the last 20 years. And uh, <coughs> uh, this is an image that I shot in uh, 1979. It's really um, one of the first uh, photographs that I shot after uh, getting out of graduate school. And, um, <coughs> <clears throat> Any questions? <laughs> no. <laughs> what is it? Uh, well, <clears throat> it's called courtroom. It's a courtroom. And uh, basically, uh, I guess I, I came out of this moment when um, I was interested primarily in what uh, artists were doing with photography rather than fine art photography as a <clears throat> category of its own. And, uh, in the late 70s, I suppose, the things I was paying attention to were uh, the way artists would use photography to document performances and installations and earthworks. Um, <coughs> people like Vito Acconci, Robert Smithson, Gordon Matto Clark, uh, <coughs> Michael Heiser, that sort of thing. But I had also developed this growing interest in architecture, which um, <clears throat> I think is also consistent with some of the things that other conceptual artists began to produce at that point in time. Uh, again, some conceptual artists began to explore architecture and build three-dimensional structures. Uh, again, like Dennis Oppenheim and Vito Acconci, began to move away from uh, performance and temporary installation into uh, architectural form. Mary Miss, Alice Aycock, people like that kind of grew out of this moment when it was somehow also tied to a desire to make an art that was somehow more politically engaged at that point in time. So <clears throat> for me, this image represents the first work that I did getting out of school, but it also represented the synthesis of different interests that I had at the time. One, in architecture, two, in film, and my own experience with television, I suppose, just you know, as one of the uh, part of this generation of artists who were first exposed to TV at an early age, grew up with television and, and film as kind of an integral part of your unconscious and conscious life. So um, I was trying to create something that integrated integrated those things in a in a single. Uh, still image. I wanted to design every element of the photograph uh, rather than simply taking a photograph, but produce something that was more than just a document, uh, that uh, produced something that had a certain drama and uh, where the photograph itself was the primary result. <coughs> okay, forward. So <coughs> theoretically, the major influence for me in architecture was Robert Venturi at the time. And I had, upon getting out of school, gotten, uh, I wouldn't say obsessed, but I got interested in complexity and contradiction in architecture and uh, learning from Las Vegas. So I was trying to produce a, a work that, on the one hand, exploited certain popular conventions in art, like the picture, and trying to produce some kind of work that represented a return to the studio at a time when artists were more like white-collar workers sitting at their desk or at their telephone, uh, <coughs> directing others to produce something. Uh, I, I was part of this generation that kind of returned 
in maybe more conservative ways to make paintings. Uh, but in my case, uh, <coughs> I wanted to make a conventional picture. Uh, this is like my sailboat picture, you know, and sort of cliche. Uh, but it was also a, an attempt to kind of evoke this sense of a three-dimensional relief uh, and uh, reflect my experience of lower Manhattan architecture, the way the buildings look like boats and so forth. But there was another thing going on with this, and that's the way I tried to put the viewer in the center in this smaller boat, uh, surrounded by larger ships. <coughs> uh, and this juxtaposition is something that became <coughs> sort of a constant theme in the rest of the work, this relationship between the individual and larger social group <coughs> surrounding it. <coughs> uh, this is an image called Desert House with Cactus. And now, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll kind of run through some of these more quickly. I won't spend as much time on each picture, but, um, <laughs> uh, or we'll be here all night. But um, this, this took me a long time to make. I mean, it was really simple, but it was the, the guard tower in the upper left-hand corner that kind of made this image in the end. It became like the Hogan's Heroes. Does anybody know Hogan's Heroes? Yeah. Was <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, it was the, it didn't work until the tower was uh, added on the upper left-hand corner. <coughs> this is called Typewriter, and um, it's, I was trying to shoot a picture that didn't take as much time to make, essentially. I wanted to use the light and the shadows to produce something. And also, you can tell I'm kind of referring to almost a very simple abstract visual space. I think I was thinking a lot about constructivism and things at the same time. And kind of theoretically, and it may not be apparent in the images, but it was something I was, I was interested in as uh, um, Anyways, I was interested in their ideas in terms of the relationship between art and life and the notion that art should have some kind of utility, that the artist can play a role in uh, uh, the world itself. Pardon me? Uh, this is still around 1980, 81, I think. And this is a library. Um, and again, uh, for me, this was about creating these single independent units in the foreground in a larger uh, social space. <coughs> this is a series of three pictures that I did, which were all driveways. And uh, they're meant to be kind of progressive, progressive uh, the more representational or more illusionistic. I think here I was trying to put the camera at the kind of child's uh, point of view, close to the ground. <coughs> this is called Back Porch. It's called Three Planes. This is a very peculiar image because a lot of what I was doing had to do with creating a very specific sense of place. And <coughs> I was shooting these planes in an attempt to deal with, I don't know, I wanted to make some kind of picture that had to do with the arms race at the time. But I couldn't, I couldn't figure out what to do with the planes. And nothing was working because I didn't have that sense of place. So finally, I simply juxtaposed this uh, globe uh, against the three. And it's the only time I've done that, sandwich negatives, to create an image. This is called Kitchen Table. And I was really um, thinking about advertising here, and kind of the, as well as the traditional still life, the cornucopia kind of image, and the way that the kitchen in contemporary advertising is this uh, sign of stability and security and um, and trying to subvert it at the same time through the use of light and shadow, basically. <coughs> this is a utility room. Again, I had this thing about 
arts having some kind of use. And so I think the utility of room is about that. It's like cre my creating some kind of constructivist space that's about a domestic uh, utilitarian space. And uh, <coughs> at the same time that I was making some of these images, I was trying to figure out what to do with them. I didn't want to show them in a, a fine art photo gallery. And in New York at the time, the art world was kind of separated so that photography was ghettoized in the context of places like light gallery or photo galleries. And it was, it was not what I wanted to do. So it <coughs> I began to look for another place to put these. And I basically um, <coughs> raised the money through public gr grants and uh, found a place to create some large-scale light boxes and install these. So in 1982, I did an installation of six of these images, about the same size as this projection, actually, um, in the Staten Island uh, um, ferry waiting room. Waiting room, in the, yeah, in the waiting room at the Stat Staten Island ferry terminal, <coughs> which had maybe 70,000 people a day going through this room to take the boat to Manhattan. This is a shooting gallery. This is um, one of the very few images that were actually based on a dream. I was, I had this dream that I was waiting in line to actually put my head through one of these holes and be shot at by, with real bullets by these people, you know, playing the game out in front. And as I stood there in line, I watched the pile of bodies behind this wall just grow larger and larger. <laughs> it was pretty grim. So uh, this is called Shooting Gallery. <coughs> these images, how they were? Well, these are, have been presented in a number of different ways. Initially, I made 16 by 20 inch black and white prints of this particular work. I also made 40 by 50 inch uh, commercial style light boxes that I displayed in public places and, and in some cases later on galleries. In this case, I also showed this as a light box in a gallery. <coughs> Sure, uh, they're all tabletop models, um, and they tend to be about 24 by 30 inches by maybe 30 inches deep or one meter deep, and uh, uh, sometimes they're larger. This was quite small. Um, but I build them basically in front of the camera and shoot Polaroid 4 by 5 film as I'm building the model, so I kind of I get instant feedback from the Polaroids so that I can change the model according to what the image looks like while I'm working on it. <coughs> um, they're, they're made of uh, foam core, math board, joint compounds. You probably have different names for all those things in England, right? But, so you don't. <coughs> but uh, what, what did you say? Plaster, yeah. Uh, Cardboard, you know, the stuff you make models of in architecture <laughs> school, you know. <laughs> Put a lot of. <laughs> Pardon me? Sir? <coughs> All that stuff. Yeah. Uh, this is a little bit different, in fact, because this is made partly of wood. Not much, but you know, the little rails are wood, and the, all those rocks are st carved styrofoam. At one point, I discovered carved styrofoam and be actually began to make more uh, three-dimensional, round, modeled shapes, I guess, rather than just constructed. But this is probably the first one where I did that. So, but this is a waterfall, and uh, this, at this point, I was thinking a lot about a, a landscape in America, and. Uh, uh, I was thinking about Hudson River School painting and 
So the idea of land shaped as man, by man, kind of uh, with a scenic overlook on the right. But this is one of the images that went into the Staten Island Ferry Terminal as well. And so I had this idea that Staten Island is to Manhattan like the country is to the city. It's the edge. It was sort of the image of the pastoral but industrial um, edge of the city that I was trying to get at. <coughs> This was called Stone House. You know, I, I, there's a real specific kind of reason for making each one of these images. And, it, and as I talk about it now, I feel a little funny because I, I'm kind of jumping around. But um, maybe at this point it will start to make a little more sense and seem a little more consistent. Some of the initial images were tended to be about um, the idea of home and images of the domestic. And so I, I began to think about my own uh, you know, this childhood in relation to the architecture in the Midwestern suburban uh, middle class subdivision. And uh, what I, I started to explore was the history of that kind of development, which um, from the 50s took me to the turn of the century to maybe 1920 with the arts and crafts movement in America and the bungalow craze, where the development of subdivisions and suburbs outside of cities like Los Angeles were tied very much to the mobility of the automobile. And, and this idea that you could, in a kind of truly democratic fashion, almost anybody could afford to buy a kit from Sears and Roebuck and have it delivered to a particular plot of land uh, on a little street, and they could build it themselves. And this bungalow would be usually thought of as a stepping stone to something fancier and more expensive as they made more money, like a Queen Anne or Victorian house in some other neighborhood somewhere else. But usually, of course, it wasn't. But anyway, this, this idea of your own little house on your own private Garden of Eden was something that um, I became obsessed with as a, you know, just as a concept, as sort of the ideal origin of this perverted, segregated, bland, boring, alienating subdivision that I spent my youth in outside Detroit. <coughs> so that's what <laughs> And uh, you know, I started thinking about architecture in a number of different ways historically. And as I go through these slides, you'll see I tended to just explore a certain trail that goes further and further back. You know. uh, but <coughs> this was called. Um, Street with pots, and it was really oh my thinking about this kind of romantic, small, idiosyncratic, or asymmetrical human scale street versus the broad boulevard of you know late nineteenth century Paris kind of thing. And I, I mean, I was trying to create this very cinematic image in the style of maybe mm, I don't know, Oscar Wilde in. Um, touch of evil or something, with this swirling shadows in the center and so forth. And the pots became the thing for me with this image. It was like when I had just enough pots, you know, it was like, it was <laughs> that's what did it. It was, they were like the birds in the birds, you know, the Hitchcock, you know, I don't know. Maybe they're not as terrifying, but that, no, these are still all shot in black and white. And this is just a color slide of a black and white print. The pots are not terrifying, I <laughs> know, but, but uh, you know, when I actually, that's what I was thinking of, was the birds when I did it. I was thinking, you know, how many birds on a wire begin to look scary kind of thing, but uh, of course, <coughs> these don't, I know. <coughs> anyway, this is a lighthouse. You know, some of these things are sort of icons of American architecture in a way, you know, the light and the dark kind of archetypal image. <coughs> this was called Cotton Mill. And I mean, many times I'm really borrowing things from different sources and juxtaposing them or synthesizing them into a single image. So here, although no one's seen this image would really think about it, I mean, the background is stolen from a photograph, Gardner photograph of the Civil War and the Appomattox River. And the foreground is really something that just caught my eye, which was a photograph of the, spirit, the spot from which Cezanne made many of his landscape paintings. So I kind of created my own combination of 
foreground and imitation of that and juxtapose the two. Yeah? I don't know if there's a good reason. Uh, I think I tended maybe to get more realistic just because I got better at making the models, you know. And, <laughs> and as you know, for better or worse, it, you know, I got carried away in that kind of illusion. <coughs> um, of course, it ended up taking more time, too, but each model began taking more time and getting more labor intensive, I suppose. <coughs> but this is called uh, Winter House. And represented another kind of step in this tracing of architectural history that I was doing, because this was my shingle-style house from the 1870s of New England. And I became interested in it shingle because it represented the departure point for um, Frank Lloyd Wright as an architect growing up in the 1870s. The first houses he did were really based on shingle-style plans. And then also for Robert Venturi in the 1960s, he returned to shingle as kind of his theoretical departure point in the process of creating what for him was, you know, this idea of the postmodern home and so forth. Um, <coughs> this is a pulpit. And, um, I, uh, I was living in L.A. when I produced, when I did this in the previous picture, kind of thinking about New England, I think, <laughs> in exile, you know. I had this tendency to make images of places that I had been rather than places I, I occupied. So I m made this, which is really a combination of different details from buildings created by a guy named Richard Munday, who's credited with being America's first architect. He was just a carpenter, really. He wasn't trained as an architect, but um, he built meeting houses all over New England. And um, for, uh, But for me, it was about a, this ambivalence I felt towards this uh, kind of wasp heritage that, uh, and my own sense of the, um, what that meant, I guess, in terms of personal identity, the, the heritage of this New England wasp culture, which I guess you know something about being English. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. <yeah. laughs> uh, no, it's hard to see when you're in the middle of something, I know. But uh, that's why it took me to go to California to look at my, you know, the New England sense of history and how it affected me and my thoughts, values, behavior, etc. Whose eyes are? Yeah. Um, I think when I started these, I uh, there was a point early on before the work you've seen where I was using objects in this kind of anthropomorphic way, you know, stand-ins for people and. Um, I took that out uh, with the idea that somehow the viewer would occupy the space rather than, um, you know, than me create someone to occupy it for them. Um, <coughs> so <coughs> anyway, this is called Arches, and uh, I, you know, I had gone out to LA to teach in 1984, and. Uh, drove across the country three times, I think, in six months, and uh, spent a lot of time looking at the landscape, which, you know, the scale of which is overpowering. So there was that. But there was also this, I kind of discovered this, this idea of the, you know, the American, the mythical idea of the West uh, and the relationship between pulp fiction and cinema. And, and I think partly in, in line with, um, my sort of Venturi pop orientation, I was interested in the way that film was a medium that was really created in constant dialogue with its audience rather than created by some um, ivory tower auteur or separated from its public. That 
that was, particularly the Western, was a, was a, you know, a genre of film that was, it was trial and error. And, and the structure of the narrative uh, was a result of this dialogue, this constant give and take with the audience. And I, that interested me. But of course, it also, the whole, you know, I was, Reagan was our president, and I was, you know, this whole myth of the West was just too much when it comes to the sense of American, uh, American identity. And I, you know, so I was thinking about that. And <coughs> in that process, I began doing these large-scale installations. This was in a, this is 1986, and it was in the third floor of a villa in uh, Arnhem in Holland. It was a large-scale sculpture exhibition. <coughs> the room is about well, it's 26 feet wide. Uh, and the ceiling is maybe nine and a half feet tall. So when you, when you entered the room, you felt quite uh, <coughs> overpowered, overwhelmed by the objects. It was claustrophobic uh, sense. All of this was built on site in about three weeks, and I uh, collapsed at the end. <laughs> but I felt like this over inflated sort of idealist uh, American in this context bec very much because there all the other European artists would come and kind of leave instructions and, and go off to dinner for eight or ten hours and drink all night and have a good time. And I would be there with my six or seven assistants day and night building the 96 objects that went into this installation. It was really... And in, a, in part, it was, it was about that. It was a kind of parody of, of, of this sense of um, ambition. But <coughs> um, I did another one when I got back to New York, and, uh, or when, when, I, uh, yeah, when I got back to New York. But this was built uh, at the, for an installation at the Walker Art Center in Minnesota and uh, traveled to the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, which is where you see this installation. It's a combination of daylight and uh, artificial light. But <coughs> I liked it because you could, at night you could see it from the street and it would be lit up inside. It was like a three-dimensional billboard, you know, through the window of the museum. On the, it's on the second floor, so you look up at it. Um, they had really just purely descript simple descriptive titles. It was um, like, in this case, it was Western sculpture with two wagons and cannon, I think. Because each one, I did a number of these, and each one contained, you know, slightly different elements. Um, I had been, actually, there, there were other installations that I did that preceded these, um, which I just didn't bring slides up. There is one of a uh, kitchen table, and a kit based, based on a kitchen table image, I did a large, kind of larger than life size version of that for a sculpture exhibition in, the mid in the Cincinnati, actually. So that was the first, and it, I guess these followed from that. Yeah. Well, I see what you mean. <laughs> I How long did it cost for your mind that you might do this in the two In each case. Yes. Or general practice. I um I didn't really think about doing installations of the earlier works. Um they were to be photographed. And the lighting and the establishing the point of view uh, was, and creating the illusion, the sense of time, and uh, the illusion of time and place and was important. So, <coughs> um, Each of these were a little different. The first was really pretty claustrophobic. The one you just saw tended to be very light and open and airy and ethereal. This was much more self-contained and, mm, I don't know, sculptural in some way. I mean, you could, you could read the three-dimensional surface as uh, 
you know, is almost having substance, I guess. <coughs> and uh, this is called, this is something I did outdoors in Atlanta, Georgia, in a place called Piedmont Park. And uh, it, <coughs> it was called Sherman's Bow Tie, which was a reference to a practice of Gen General Sherman towards the end of the Civil War as he marched through the South. He would, uh, in order to avoid <coughs> or prevent the Confederates from reconstructing their supply lines, he would heat up the railroad ties or the railroad tracks and wrap them around trees. So this is your artist's rendition of that practice. I never saw one of these in reality. <laughs> but <coughs> and I did a number of other sort of freestanding independent sculptures that rela were related to some of these ideas. In, uh, we're talking about like 89, 90. And then I moved into building some large scale structures using real materials. I wanted to get away from this idea of the image or the s surface being more important than the material and the texture and the color and so forth. So this was a somewhat um, well, I tried to think small, but it ended up, <laughs> you know, I tried to be practical. But this was actually about the same size as the other installations. It's 26 feet in diameter, roughly, and 13 and a half, 14 feet tall. <coughs> and it was built uh, on the occasion of the opening of a museum, in a new museum building in Tampa, Florida. So. I, I, I don't. <laughs> That's why it's all. <laughs> exactly. No. Um, I, you know, I just, I, I was thinking about the, it was, I had a crew. I had a guy who has worked with me on these installations in the past that I relied on completely. And uh, he, and we then hired a crew in Florida to, to build this for us, essentially, that primarily built amusement parks. They built rides and, and, and all over the South. They did, uh, so they were experts at building <laughs> ridiculous things and ridic in ridiculous ways. So it was, anyway, so in part this was meant to refer to that kind of uh, theme park context, you know, but it was, and also the precariousness of the environment, the, and, and there are certain architectural elements here that were specific to the South, like the structure on the far right is a shotgun house, which is kind of a late 19th century working class housing that you see all over the American South. The central uh, su structure is another uh, kind of um, bungalow. It had, um, it had moving, I guess just one moving sort of mock video camera on that pole in the center that was kind of looking down at the viewer. but. Um, <coughs> Is that a hiccup or a question? Elegant tunnel values of the photographs or the. Um, yeah. Uh, I don't know. I mean, this, you know, this is about real space and real texture and material, and um, uh, it was. I don't know. I. I I mean, looking at these, I have other problems with it. Not the materials, and, but kind of the way it's all held together. Um, there's something about it being too self-contained for me at this point and too, too complete, too finished. But um, it's, um, I think in part it did what I set out to do in terms of just getting beyond the, um, at least in the three-dimensional structures I was building this, the, the object as primarily image, you know, as, as surface alone. And um, 
it had a, you know, a scale and a um, presence that was very much about being in that space at that time. Um, <coughs> anyway, the, here it's installed in New York in the gallery. It was like the only gallery that was commercial gallery that was big enough to hold it in Manhattan, but it has, we had to knock a hole through the wall on the right in order to fit it. So it's, it's it, and I did some other structures. This is one that I did in Belgium, actually, shortly thereafter. It's the only slide I have of it. And there were some other pieces that were kind of related to this. This is, again, about 1990. <coughs> uh, <coughs> so after doing some of the large-scale construction in the Western, I did a group of these images for partly with a specific uh, in installation in a train station in mind, where I combined a very simple still life foreground with mm, kind of images of far away, the west, um, uh, and these went into the, um, as light boxes they wrapped around a room at the Long Island Railroad waiting room at Penn Station in Midtown Manhattan. And, um, This is one of the few times where I actually took several small elements that I'd constructed for one photograph and reused them in others. Sort of had this, I would constantly move. I would throw either, I would keep things around, but I wouldn't reuse them generally, except in this, in this small stretch here. <coughs> and um, now I also began doing a series of architectural facades that had to do with this, an interest in the development of different architectural types. So this, which was called Mission Facade, was the first of those, really. Um, <coughs> this is one slide that I have of the installation at Penn Station, which I guess is about 1991. <coughs> Well, <coughs> I'm not sure how. There are a couple things that went into it for me. Um, uh, I had this idea initially that I wanted to, um, <coughs> earlier on when I did the first one in the early 80s, that I wanted to introduce the photograph in the context in which we experience it most frequently the, as a general public. So I wanted it in the context of advertising in this case, but in in a physical space, the physical space. Um, and I was definitely attracted to a kind of space that had to do initially with being slightly on the outskirts, with being on, being on the edge somehow, being in that case, in both cases, sort of on the edge of the city. If in this case, not literally because you're in the heart of the city, but you're, you're at that point where you either arrive or depart. And, um, um, the images in this case had to do with that sense of travel, whether it was like psychological or, you know, a sort of romantic notion of the far away and creating a mental space that was very much different from what the mental space of your average commuter would be upon arriving, you know. So sort of I, I, um, <coughs> but otherwise, I, I kind of wanted to intervene in a way that was unexpected and um, inexplicable, I suppose, to your average uh, traveler. <laughs> no identification, no logic for why it's there, that kind of thing. <coughs> With the Penn Station project, they, they uh, after I, whatever, it was eight years after I did the first one, and people like, um, um, what's his name, uh, uh, who builds the bus shelters? Um, <laughs> Adams. Dennis Adams. Dennis Adams, for example, had begun building light box installations into bus shelters, so very much influenced by constructivist, you know, approach to art and architecture. And so I, uh, I don't know, <laughs> but I, I was trying, I think, in a, in a different, to do something similar in a very different, but in a very different way, um, <coughs> certainly without the structure. Anyway. 
So mission facade may be the church. This would be the state. Um, so consistent with my urge to find the origin of certain architectural types, like the suburb, I shot this picture of the Venice ghetto because it represented the perverse origin of the modern high-rise apartment building. Does that make sense? This is an you know, island outside of the city of Venice that Jews were forced to live on. They could work in the rest of the city, but at night they had to go live on this island. And as a result of overcrowding, they built higher and higher. And so therefore, we have the world's first high-rise apartments. Anyway. <coughs> this is a tenement. Kind of Lower East Side Manhattan tenement. Eventually, they get thrown out. I, kinda, I usually keep them for about six months or a year, and then when I don't have any more room, they, they go out. So <laughs> so that's, 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 that's psychology, but as you say, the, the more you do, the more complicated or more tiny things mm -hmm. become. Mm -hmm. uh, you, there are other situations where the objects are, physical objects that can go off and be in a museum or have some other life beyond that, but they usually live for the first second of the camera. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess that's why I don't throw them out right away. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, this was a this is a nice model. You know, <laughs> <It> was, <laughs> if this had been cast in plaster, it would have been nice. You know, beautiful. It had a certain it had a certain depth and character that was. Nice. But of course, I shot this of Manhattan while I was living in Boston, another case where I just you know, I'm dreaming of something, another place in time. But uh, this is a Portuguese beachfront, sort of being. <laughs> overwhelmed by a tidal wave in the background. That line on an angle is meant to be a tidal wave. <coughs> and this uh, is an image called Industry, which was <coughs> sort of uh, important for me because as I began looking more at Euro the history of European architecture, particularly in the 18th century, um, and the development of different cultural institutions, during the Enlightenment, I found this picture of a glass factory in England that um, had a large uh, tower smokestack to one side. And <coughs> theoretically, it became important because at that time, this concern for ventilation and clean air and getting toxic fumes up and away from workers, uh, getting clean air into hospitals so that uh, airborne germs aren't transmitted to other patients became important. And so that, I, that, that concern for the circulation uh, became central to the development of all kinds of different architectures, including the prison. So this was, uh, so we have <coughs> symmetrical structures being built around this central idea. And this, this was my this model was based on the, I, the pan idea of the panopticon, you know, the Jerry Mike Bentham idea of the round prison with the guard tower in the center thing where you can see into every cell. Um, <coughs> and I began to look at the development of different um, types in prison architecture and so set about making photographs essentially based on each different uh, plan, uh, most of which were developed in the United States, of course. And this is a uh, radial plan. It's also taken after a prison in um, Philadelphia, Eastern Pennsylvania State Penitentiary, which was built in the 1830s and became the model for a radial prison, which was widely copied throughout the world. Not in the United States because it was really kind of a, it was a dismal failure in the United States. It was uh, based on the total isolation of prisoners. But um, solitary confinement as a form of punishment was very much part of this. <coughs> um, prisoners had private exercise yards. They ate in their cell. Um, the only visitors they were allowed were um, <coughs> Quaker ministers, actually. 
since this whole idea was developed through the Quaker idea of you know, th this notion that if you <coughs> you can reform uh, the behavior of a criminal by putting by isolating him and he and his dial or she and her dialogue with her conscience and with God will reform their ways, etc. But uh, of course, it didn't work, and um, the bulk of the prisoners in Philadelphia, particularly, were not Quakers. They were, you know, more of them were Italians. They were used to big families and overcrowded apartments. It drove them mad. So um, <coughs> you find a lot of them in uh, in um <coughs> Pennsylvania, but not throughout the country. This is the <coughs> model after a fire. <laughs> I, was, I, I was also getting tired of building models at this point. <laughs> and, uh, part of, I think part of my infatuation with the prison was the sense that I'd been building these things for so damn long. You know, it was like I, 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 it, you know, I was feeling confined by my own subject and own methodology, I guess. And so, uh, in a very self-reflective way, I be, you know, the prison became significant personally as well as because I was interested in this social reality. Um, this is Sing Sing. Sing. The Sing Sing Auburn model was the other primary prison model developed at the time, and um, which involved uh, more social space, meals together, work, and so forth. But <coughs> this is called uh, Georgian Jail Cages, and it was based on a little well, on the, <coughs> on the mobile uh, jail cages that were used throughout the South after the Civil War, um, prisons were really uh, <coughs> used for forced labor widely throughout, particularly the South in the late 19th century, uh, tended to replace slavery as a legal institution, I guess. I mean, certainly, um, the bulk of the population in prison was black, and black people certainly could be arrested on very little provocation and thrown in jail and forced to work for months or years. And, you know, so <coughs> this is another image of the Panopticon. Then I began doing some interior images, the cells. This is just called cell with toilet. This is a prison cell with a skylight. This is called barrel vaulted room. <coughs> this one is called Asylum. These are color, if you hadn't noticed. At some point I switched to color film and I began essentially shooting the same black and white models with color and the time that I did the prisons. So, and I, <coughs> I think well, th there was a silly technical reason for doing that initially, um, but <coughs> ultimately, you know, I felt like I was building these barren kind of te uh, spaces devoid of action and devoid of objects, and adding the extra sort of level of minimal amount of color seemed to be the thing to do. But um, just to create one more element of kind of sensory, sensuous, Nuss, I guess. This is simply called toilets. Yeah, these um, these are like four by five feet. Um, so yeah, the, they got larger, and I think I I was trying to create in these cases with with the interior spaces basically uh, a sense create the sense that the viewer could be in. In that room, or be or enter the room. <coughs> this is called tunnels. This model is larger. This is actually about ten feet deep and ten feet wide at the back, where it's it's only about twelve inches high. <coughs> no, <laughs> no, never, never. <laughs> True. They're yeah. They're at the currently 
Some of these are on exhibition at a place called Site Gallery in Sheffield. If anyone is up there, <coughs> probably through February. It's called Apps. It's called Arcade. Not necessarily a prison, but um, I guess I started thinking about the tunnels image and began getting involved in this, uh, the idea of a shared social or public space and taking more classical forms and manipulating them. This is called arena. This is a square image, which is called Nine Alcoves, which is <coughs> my rendition, artist's rendition again, of uh, the architecture of a Samuel Beckett novel. This is a short novel called The Lost Ones, in which, uh, which is <coughs> about a room, a round room made of cement, in which, which is filled with people <coughs> who establish a social structure, kind of all based on uh, <coughs> who gets to sit in these little alcoves up above. If they're <coughs> so they have ladders going up to these little rooms, and um, I guess they would be like 20 feet high. <laughs> so, so there's a whole waiting period that you have to wait in line to get up to this ladder so you can sit by yourself with these interconnected alcoves up above. <coughs> and I just brought a couple slides of some lithographs that I did which were related to the prison idea. This is a, it's actually a very soft print. It's an image of a prison in Phnom Penh with the nine different plans superimposed um, on it. Uh, <coughs> oh, an upside down slide. <laughs> I thought we dealt with that, but no. Well, can we turn it over? Is that Joel? Might as well. Anyway, this is a simple um, juxtaposition of an empty cafeteria with the um <coughs> a s very small print of the toilet to the right, individual cell, and sort of public, private, eating, defecating, juxtaposition. <laughs> and <coughs> uh, I think this is the last one on this carousel. There's one, I have another carousel with just a few slides on it that I'll show you before we break, but um, it's got <coughs> got earlier work on it. <coughs> in it. So these were the first images that I set up to photograph, and they were quite simple, as you can see. They all had very elaborate, ridiculous titles. Oh, God, <laughs> it's embarrassing. Uh, this was called Fan as You Daemonist, Relaxing After an Exhausting Day at the Beach. And um, you daemonists were this obscure Greek of a group of Greek philosophers that believed that the pursuit of happiness was the highest good. <coughs> um, and this was, this had a long title too, but it was like Basilis Pestis, was all I remember, it's a, which is the name for the plague. Anyway, this, this was important to me because it kind of had to do with this idea of TV, my relationship to television. It was really about this confusion I'm, I'm, that I had about reality and television. Uh, pardon me? That is. Those are mice. Yeah. I, uh, <coughs> I had this idea that when I was small, when I was little I had a little chair and tables in, the, in what we called the breezeway where I would watch TV in this little built-in hole in the wall and I'd get up early in the morning and watch these cartoons from the 30s, along with the farm report in the Midwest and in this divided screen. But anyway, I had this idea that one day a bunch of mice actually ran out from behind the TV and disappeared in the other room. So <coughs> this is somehow about that <coughs> confusion. <coughs> this is uh, called fork in, fork in the refrigerator. I don't know. 
<laughs> this is a furnace with a flame. <coughs> These are from 1975 and 76. This is um, backwards, but it's called Finding a Shiny New Copy of My Father's 1933 Boy Scout Scarf in a New Jersey Dormitory Lobby. <coughs> But, you know, here is when I'm actually animating the objects. This is so, <coughs> and this was called Bed Upturning Its Belly at Dawn. These, um, these two slides were, well, I was thinking about creating a sense of place, right? And in this case, I didn't have it because I didn't have a room. So I shot it again with a corner, and uh, this did it for me somehow. One was called, no, I guess that was called office. The other was called desk with chair. Anyway, this is a boy's bedroom. These are, and yeah, it was like 1976. And this is a series of 10 images which went together as one piece. Um, and it, meant, it was meant to be a narrative, um, which you read left to right. It was largely about editing and my trying to create a storyboard, um, thinking about Eisenstein and montage and so forth. But um, kind of an epic, um, mundane sequence. Uh, the college dormitory. <coughs> it's supposed to be falling in love, you know. The Rom <laughs> Romeo Juliet balcony. Full moon. <laughs> this is a little consummation of that love, I guess. <laughs> the pillows on top of one. It's, in, it's interesting that as, the, uh, as the, the way in which you made the models and created the, the, the environments got more and more sophisticated and, and somewhat beautiful, but also the sort of seems like the slapstick uh, humor elements did sort of change into a more formal. <laughs> I don't know what it is. I, 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 maybe, maybe that's it. <coughs> I don't know. This was the sickness <laughs> image. <laughs> it was some people interpreted this as abortion, but uh, pardon me, what? This doesn't look like a hospital room. Oh, I see. This is death. This is the tragic death image. Cam moving back with the camera, so <laughs> quite a bit, yeah. So <coughs> this is supposed to be the art, committed to art kind of thing, media. I don't know. This is hopping a freight train. And this is sort of a arrival in Manhattan image, sort of only a reversal of the famous Stieglitz photograph where you're on Staten Island. We are on Manhattan looking at the Staten Island ferry arrive. This is on the ferry arriving, looking at Manhattan. Anyway, um, I don't know if I should show these, but, <laughs> but I'll run through them quickly since they're in the carousel and I got this far. This was really just a group of images that went into a, it was a film that I made the, uh, comprised of still images, slides. And uh, it had a very kind of staccato, staccato uh, uh, anxiety-ridden soundtrack. Some music, some Charlie Parker, and I don't know. No real um, explanation for what's going on in the text of the film, though. <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> so that's the end. So <laughs> I guess we got um, five or ten minutes for some questions. I guess, yeah? Sure. Yep, fine. Questions? Um, hmm. Or comments, not questions? Nothing? <coughs> Yeah. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Um, well, uh, I don't know. I think, you know, initially I was shooting black and white photographs, and it didn't really, um, they weren't really monochrome. I mean, they were, I mean, okay, they were black and white photographs, but the things were, Chosen for value rather than color, obviously. Um, I think with the prison imagery, you know, since it's color film and they're color photographs, it's simply a, you know, a reflection of this barrenness of the environment. Um, I think it's taste, or it's, you know, it's what I'm attached to at this point. It's not, you know, there's no logic to it really. I mean, I'm tempted to, you know. Well, that's, that's true. I mean, I suppose that was very consciously the logic initially when I was using black and white, that I, black and white for me had to do more with memory and the past. Color was very much about the present. And that, yeah, so. Yeah, exactly. It was more contemporary. Memories were black and white. Yeah. Kind of intensity. <laughs> yeah, I've visited a lot of prisons. I guess uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I was, <laughs> uh, I, you know, I haven't, I haven't spent a lot of time as a prisoner, but uh, no, I, yeah, certainly, I, I, the one in Philadelphia I spent a lot of time at. Um, it, well, I visited, I've been to occupied and unoc yeah, abandoned and ones that are still in use. It's difficult in the States to get access, you know, I mean, if you don't, I've actually visited people and, you know, I've gone with friends who had relatives in prison. I've, you know, I've, uh, but largely my experience is with the empty ones. It's hard if you don't have a real, you know, if you don't have a friend who's there or a family member, it's hard to get in and look, <laughs> look around. <laughs> it's, but, um, <coughs> Yeah, um, um, I, yeah, because I think they're partly about that, um, not neutrality, but uh, both sides of the equation. I mean, it's not, it's part of the initial, <coughs> like the barrel vaulted room was specifically meant to address this idea that the prison was in its origin related to the idea of a monastery and that the hope was that people in prison would reform and, you know, uh, there was a religious connection and uh, a, it was a positive humanistic reform that replaced the spectacle of uh, public humiliation or mutilation or execution. And um, <coughs> it's become a matter of mere warehousing at this point than 
rather than uh, either uh, extreme punishment or uh, <coughs> or reform in the sense of reintegrating someone into society. So, I mean, uh, what I was trying to address really was the origins, historically and theoretically, of the whole idea of incarceration and its tie to that religious context. <coughs> I mean, it, more broadly, I suppose the images are about a different, you know, an experience which isn't literally, doesn't literally have to be prison or monastery, but it, you know, it has to do somehow with solitude and subjectivity and <coughs> those kind of issues. Well, <coughs> I, <coughs> I think um, that may be why the prison imagery made sense to me. It was not also that somehow, the, in terms of my process, I mean, I, I think they're about order. You know, they're, I mean, so I think I became interested in that aspect of what I did and wanted to exaggerate it and um, ask questions about it. Um, and about my relationship to it. Right. You're saying that <coughs> what you're suggesting is that perhaps the prison was more colorful, and that that I drained the color out of it, and that perhaps I ought to choose a gallery because it starts out as all white, or maybe a Richard Meyer house, or something. <laughs> no, no I'm, I don't mean to be sarcastic, but yeah. No, I think I was, I mean, I'm definitely interested in that similarity. I mean, it's sort of, there's this a relationship between the image of the room and the idea of the studio, and as well as the gallery, sort of going in both directions. Walking into the work, it's con consistent with the space in which it's viewed in some way. That's, I don't know. I mean, in other ways too. An association. Right. 
Yeah, I think it's very different, though. Um, <coughs> I did a whole number of models of prisons on the computer, actually, a number of years ago, and uh <coughs> they have a very different feel, in a sense. I mean, it's, it's, it's high-tech, you know. And there's something about the man-made, uh, the texture of these, the constructions, the irregularities, however small they might be, that's entirely different. It's an entirely different order from a computer-generated simulation. I, I know what you're, you know, one would think that what you're saying is right, just, and, uh, but in fact, it's, com it's they, in the way you experience the image, they're really quite worlds apart. Um, I don't have any of those slides, but, um, you know, the smallest irregularities, uh, become much more magnified in a, something like these that are handmade. Yeah. Um, I The scale issues always seemed to be really important to me. Somehow that they were either, you know, they were little or they were huge. You know, it was like this diverging from standard expectations. Kinda. But um, so the installations tended to be larger than life size. But um, uh, it's I haven't really moved. I'm not sure if this is what you're implying, but intermittently I would build these large-scale installations rather than sort of having made a body of work that's photography, then made a body of work that's sculpture, and then yeah. photography again. Yeah. Sort of, yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, um, I guess that I always felt compelled to try and make something in real space. Uh, just, and I, um, <coughs> I, just because of the way I make things to photograph, there's some kind of, you know, there's a desire to work physically in relation to the viewer. I think I'm, maybe I'm getting some of that out of my system by developing a scale in a, in a photograph that actually has a physical relationship to the viewer, even though it's illusionistic. Um, but it's something that I still, toy with and think about. And um, I haven't done any large-scale installations in some time, but, you know, it's kind of one of those things that's always working in the back of my mind, is just a desire to deal with real space. Anything else? Is that it? Just to fully explain all this okay. there. Um, <coughs> as you said earlier, the, s the exhibition's on the site gallery in Sheffield, so I hope you can make it. And I hope we can make it next week as well, too, Elizabeth Wright. Uh, who's got a few pieces that uh, 